and to take concrete action with the 10 billion tree tsunami campaign and many other initiatives. For my part, I will continue pressing for action to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, which means to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. And it means more ambition by all, more ambition on mitigation, adaptation, resilience and finance. And major emitting countries and industrial sectors have a particular responsibility to lead the way. And it means a successful UN Climate Conference COP26 later this year in Glasgow, and I count on Pakistan's strong commitment to that. Finally, I would like to recognize Pakistan's commitment to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the world's framework for eliminating poverty, achieving gender equality, protecting the environment, and building a fair globalization that works for all. Pakistan was in the global lead in integrating the Sustainable Development Goals into its own national development agenda. And this is yet another example of the commitment and vision that we need to see more of around, to see more of around the world. I look forward to the rest of my visit and engaging with the leadership and people of Pakistan and the United Nations family is strongly committed to helping the country advance prosperity and peace for all. Thank you. Yes, TV, Isa, May I request you to please introduce yourself and also um, please uh, let us know who the question is directed to. Um, this is Isa Nakhvi representing Indus News. Excellency, I'm here. Um, uh, my question uh, is that um, I'll also, as Foreign Minister Qureshi has mentioned, I'll also refer to your statement of 8th of August last year, in which you re reaffirmed United Nations' uh, principal position on uh, the Kashmir dispute. I wish to know what practical steps uh, could you and your office take for the solution of this issue? And secondly, we are uh, about one and a half months into the year 2020, and there have been more than 287 ceasefire violations along the line of control. Uh, I wish to know what's stopping United Nations to ensure uh, the, uh, th that its military observers are given a hassle-free and free access to the line of control as this may lead to a, a, conf a big conflict in the region. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. First of all, from the beginning, I have offered my good offices in relation to the situation. And of course, good offices can only work when accepted by both sides. Uh, uh, on the other hand, um, uh, I believe that there was an important contribution to clarifying what has happened by the reports that were mentioned of the Human Rights High Commissioner. On the other hand, uh, uh, it is clear that we have taken uh, a position about the need for Security Council resolutions to be implemented and for effective de-escalation and dialogue linked to that with uh, another very important condition, which is full respect for human rights and continental freedoms in Jammu and Kashmir. In relation to the ceasefire, I visited Unmojib. Um, uh, we uh, believe that Unmojib should have full freedom of uh, movement. Uh, it has on the Pakistani side. We hope that this will also be achieved on the other side. And we will be strengthening uh, its equipment capacity in order to better uh, be able to implement its mandate. Um, I think a question from the international media representatives here. Um, I Yes, can I have the Reuters representative? Reuters, not this. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, okay. I'll take a question from uh, Independent News, Mona. Mona Khan. Uh, this is Mona representing Independent Urdu. Uh, my question is for Mr. Foreign Minister. The world is witnessing in increased unilateral and xenophobic tendencies to exclude minorities on the basis of their religion, as we have seen the recent example in our neighbor India as well. So I just want to ask uh, what steps your government have taken to curb and to address these issues internationally? Thank you. Well, Pakistan has uh, been uh, voicing its concern at every possible forum. Uh, we feel that this act is discriminatory in nature. Uh, and it's not just Pakistan saying that. Today, uh, 
there are voices within India that are questioning uh, the reasoning uh, and the need for this action. Uh, you've seen protests all over. Uh, you've seen chief ministers leading protests. You have seen uh, there have been lives lost. Close to 25 people were killed uh, uh, by, by the uh, security forces uh, in, in, in India, and many have been wounded. So uh, that is an ongoing uh, 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 process. Pakistan has and will continue to highlight that. In fact, today, what Pakistan was saying uh, to the world that, listen, there is a new mindset that is governing India. And these actions have endorsed our point of view. And, and a large section of the Indian population is endorsing what Pakistan has been advocating. Yes, the gentleman there. Me? <coughs> Sorry for that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My question is to Mr. Antonio Gutierrez. I'm the correspondent from China Xinhua News Agency. And as we know that four Pakistani citizens who have been affected, affected by... Sorry? <laughs> okay, I will be louder. You need to speak slowly. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm the correspondent from China Xinhua News Agency. And my question is that... Uh, my question is that... Uh, for Pakistani citizens who have been infected by the novel coronavirus uh, phenomena in China have already been cured and discharged three days ago. And uh, as we know, the Chinese government and people have already been making uh, an all-out efforts to fight the novel coronavirus disease uh, with notable outcomes. So how do you evaluate those measures? And in terms of the uh, high uh, top leaders commanding and uh, mobilization of the whole country. Do you think that China offers a uh, useful uh, reference to the, to the other countries and the whole world uh, in handling such a, a big public health threat? Thank you so much. Well, first of all, in relation to the Pakistanis uh, in China, I believe that the government has been in close contact with World Health Organization and that the government has acted in line with uh, the principles defined by the World Health Organization in that regard. Uh, in relation to the situation in itself, it's of course a huge challenge. I believe that uh, the response uh, has been uh, a, a, a very strong and uh, very impressive response. Uh, obviously, in a situation as complex as this, it is always difficult to uh, have a, a quick solution, and the Chinese government was the first to, to mention that there were a few limitations and uh, uh, shortcomings, but I think that uh, the effort that is in place is a gigantic effort, and we are uh, very confident that that effort uh, will allow for the progressive reduction of the disease. Uh, uh, first of all, most welcome, uh, Mr. Secretary General, to Pakistan. I am Faisal Raza Khan from 92 News. Uh, my question is that, uh, as uh, Honorable Foreign Minister has said, uh, would you agree uh, to that uh, early repatriation of Afghan refugees vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, to the peace process? Do you think that uh, early repatriation would help a successful a peace and reconciliation process in Afghanistan. Thank you. I think it's very important to respect the principles. I mean, the principles that have always been uh, principles shared between the government of Pakistan and the uh, UNHCR have been the principle of voluntary repatriation in safety and dignity. What we believe is this is the moment in which we need to create uh, an important pull effect in, uh, uh, in Afghanistan through peace and through reconstruction, the creation of jobs, the creation of opportunities, making the roadmap that was uh, uh, described by the minister, a roadmap to allow for a phased program of return of the Afghans uh, to be entirely successful. I think now the biggest effort to be made is in Afghanistan, and uh, I appeal to the international community to massively support Afghanistan, both to reach peace and then, based on peace, to do uh, 
an effective reconstruction of the country to create the conditions for uh, not only the, the well-being of the Afghan people uh, in Afghanistan, but for the uh, effective uh, repatriation of refugees from Pakistan and Iran. Thank you. Uh, can I have the Al Jazeera representative at the back, please? Anas. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, this is Anas Malik from The Onset. Pakistan has lost billions of dollars fighting the quest, uh, fighting the war on terror, in an attempt to make this uh, country, uh, make this world a better place to live. And how do you see Pakistan's effort to counter the menace of transnational terrorism? And uh, would you or your office play a role, an active role in convincing? Because there are some countries who are not fully convinced with Pakistan's effort to counter the menace of terrorism. Would your office be playing a role to convince or convey to those countries that, yes, Pakistan has done enough? How do you see that? Thank you. Well, I can testify. I came once to uh, Islamabad. And Islamabad was a military camp. And the Taliban was very close, were, the Pakistani Taliban were very close to Islamabad. They had uh, overrun the Swat Valley and they were even a little bit further south. And I have to say that uh, to be today in Islamabad, a family duty station for UN staff, uh, and to compare with the past and to know what in between has been done in the territories that uh, were uh, FATA and now I believe are uh, integrated in Khyber Pashtunkhwa. Um, and to see that an administration is being put in place and to see that uh, uh, there is uh, uh, an intense program of development. Uh, I believe that one has to recognize that the efforts that Pakistan has made to fight terrorism are absolutely remarkable and that they were uh, very successful. And uh, everybody should support Pakistan to, uh, I would say, consolidate this uh, enormous effort that I could witness myself. As I said, I've been here in the worst phase of the problem and it's uh, very rewarding to come back and see how different things are. Yes. Last question, Mateen Heather. Uh, Matina, they're representing uh, GTV Network. Mr. Secretary General, there is another uh, global issue that is Islamophobia, and that why West fears Islam and the Muslims. And it is to be noted that Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, and Malaysia have taken a joint initiative to counter this Islamophobia. We were there at UNGA when you also spoke about this in your speech uh, in last year UNGA session. How you view these efforts? And what further support you will extend to this initiative taken by Pakistan? And to Foreign Minister as well, your views as well. Thank you. Well, Islamophobia is absolutely intolerable, as any other form of uh, intolerance that we see today be it against uh, migrants or refugees that uh, sometimes are attacked uh, uh, by uh, uh, populist politicians uh, or uh, other forms uh, of religious hatred uh, uh, of all kinds. So it is for me absolutely evident that uh, we need to fight Islamophobia very strongly. Hate speech is one of the most important instruments of Islamophobia. And uh, we have launched uh, recently, um, led by our um, Special Representative Against Genocide, we have launched a, a global UN initiative against hate speech, uh, which I believe goes perfectly in line with the, the initiative that you have just mentioned. And uh, at the same time, um, we are totally committed uh, in our action around the world to fight against all forms of populism that try to use Islamophobia and other uh, forms of hatred as a tool to win votes, uh, which is uh, totally uh, unacceptable. Um, it is unacceptable that people try to win power dividing the people. This uh, is against all democratic principles, and I think it's our duty to preserve interface dialogue, to preserve harmony among religions, and I believe that my visit tomorrow to the corridor um, of um, uh, Kantarpur uh, will be um, uh, a symbol of that uh, um, dialogue and of that uh, tolerance. 
uh, Mateen Hedda Saab, uh, in our discussions that I had uh, with the Secretary General earlier on, uh, I drew a comparison. Uh, a comparison between the Kartarpur initiative and the Kartarpur spirit in Pakistan and the demolition of the Babri Mosque in India. Now, these are two clear uh, manifestations uh, where we stand and where we are seeing uh, our neighbor uh, heading. Islamophobia is a growing concern. Our government has taken note of it. We have raised it at every level. We feel that hate speech uh, being used as a political instrument is very dangerous. Uh, it has uh, already started impacting uh, European politics. Uh, and you've seen how the far right uh, has taken advantage of that. Uh, we have come to the conclusion that whenever we raise this issue, I remember uh, raising the issue uh, with the uh, uh, former minister of Netherlands on uh, the issue of caricatures, and I was told, you know, uh, we'll have to respect freedom of speech. One does respect freedom of speech as a Democrat, but you have to draw a line somewhere. And we came to the conclusion, Pakistan and other friends that you mentioned came to the conclusion that uh, just complaining isn't enough. We've got to do something ourselves. And we've got to uh, uh, tell the world what the true Islam is, uh, what the true image of Islam is. And we have to sell to the world our narrative and our, uh, our point of view. And for that, I think this effort that you mentioned of launching a, 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 a television channel which projects the correct uh, uh, image of Islam and not the distorted uh, vision will be helpful. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Oh, you want to